Our session is uh, ensuring uh, FPUC in the red, and um, we are co-organizing. Uh, I'm from CIFO, and uh, also a research institute for humanity and nature, Kyoto, and we have a kind of project working on market-driven resource management system like RED or FSC, and how it's uh, impact on the social community. And also I co-organizing with um, Yuki from um, Global Environmental Forum, Japan. And to, since many of, many of you know that yesterday the Sabusta Red uh, Safeguards meeting was, they are not, I don't think they're not gonna go into have a conclusion for this. I don't know, they might walk, walk in today or tomorrow to kind of come back next week. But for the Safeguards, I think quite important issues on Red and we want to discuss on how the FPIC is praying this uh, safeguards discussion. And also uh, for this, uh, we uh, also want to discuss not only uh, RED, but we also have some uh, FSC and also other uh, case studies from uh, uh, Asia and uh, uh, Latin America and South America. Um, <clears throat> and now, um, so, Currently, also, uh, Japanese government uh, now try to start a joint credit mechanism. It's kind of bilateral red, uh, bilateral me uh, mechanism for the climate change, and the uh, possibility to expand this joint credit mechanism into a red. Uh, and it's kind of bilateral uh, uh, outside of, uh, it's kind of voluntary mechanism uh, outside of uh, UNCCC, but we wanted to see how this uh, is evolve in uh, next, few years, and uh, is, Yuki is working on how to ensure uh, safeguards aspect and epic aspect for that kind of bilateral uh, project. So maybe i just give a mic to Yuki and start her presentation. Thank you very much. So, and since we have less people, please come forward that, so that we can have more, how to say, warm. <laughs> Uh, we can more easily to discuss all. And please, inter uh, please uh, you, uh, yeah, feel free to ask question after. We have six speakers, so after two speakers, we have our questions. Then we pass on to our next speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daisuke. Uh, um, my name is Yuki Sakamoto from Global Environmental Forum. Um, Nonprofit environmental organization based in Tokyo. Uh, first of all, I would like to express our gratitude for the, all the participants and speakers on behalf of organizers of this session. <clears throat> I hope this panel uh, could be a good opportunity for all of us to explore better ways of implementation and designing of ethnic guideline or process sh sharing our experiences. I'm here to present uh, our project to develop FP guideline primarily targeting Japanese organization and private businesses uh, that are interested in REDD projects. In 2012, Two Japanese organizations, namely Global Environmental Forum and Japan Tropical Forest Action Network, launched the project to develop, test, and promote social safeguard guidelines which contribute to forest conservation in developing countries. Uh, we, have, we had learned FPIC is the core concept as social safeguard for red uh, but at that time, uh, there was not enough information and experiences shared among Japanese society on this issue if we compared with environmental safeguard issues, such as biodiversity conservation. Um, now we have another concern, as Japanese government is actively promoting joint crediting mechanism, JCM, uh, as a uh, bilateral scheme to tackle climate change uh, using market mechanism. Uh, let is covered under JCM, and it should have safeguard rules and guidelines, but it's not clear yet. It will be the same level 
as other scheme under UNFCCC. So that uh, we want to demonstrate our ethnic guideline as one of important uh, tool, safeguard tool for JCM. We developed the guideline by doing bibliographic research and getting comments from Japanese and international um, experts through interviews and workshop. We compared and analyzed requirements of the existing guidelines, uh, such as uh, REDD plus SES, uh, UN-led program social and environmental principle and criteria, and also FSC's guideline on ethic and uh, um, Forest People's Program guideline on ethics. And uh, we picked out the essential point uh, from those guidelines. Here you can see the four elements of ethic. Uh, ethic is an acronym stand, standing for free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, it refers to a right or principle applied to the case in which indigenous people and other community determine if they give consent to a project that may affect their land, territory, or resources. Ethic was originally recognized as a right of indigenous people by the United Nations and the other organizations, but recently it has become applied to not only indigenous people, but also local community. In practical implementation of ethic, where forest-dependent people live in or near a project site, it's impossible to develop the project without any consent or participation from them. In our guideline, we therefore assume that ethic is applicable to all community that have legitimate rights, uh, whether they are indigenous or not. Here, you can see the structure of our ethic guideline. One of the features in our guideline is indicating eight steps uh, plus uh, 36 activities to implement ethic in time series. These steps are tailored for RDD on a project basis and address each phase in each phase of the project development. I will briefly explain eight steps. Um, step one, preliminary arrangements with proponents. Purpose of this step is to uh, do internal preparation within uh, proponents. Uh, proponents need internal preparation and arrangement by establishing human rights policy. Their concept of respecting human rights is be specifically defined. This policy is then informed that the entire staff of the proponents, as well as announced to the public to ascertain the realization of the concept. At step 1.5, communication needs to be two ways exchange. Uh, proponents need to pay special attention to vulnerable and marginalized groups with, within community. Uh, step 1.6, Within basic concept, it's important to set adequate purposes of the project, as it's essential not only for implementation of the project, uh, but also for monitoring. Step one seven, project impact assessment should cover not only social and environmental aspect, but also human rights aspect. More specifically, it's important to predict who are likely to be affected and how they are likely to be affected when the project is implemented. Uh, full assessment is conducted under step 4.2. Um, step 2, this step is relevant to prelim 
preliminary phase of consultation with communities towards obtaining ethics. In this step, pro proponents initiate actual contact with indigenous and the local community which live in or near the project sites. Proponents identify the indigenous and the local community which will receive positive and negative impacts from the project, as well as roughly figure out what rights and interests they have, who needs to be sold ethnic, and who doesn't need uh, ethnic, uh, it means merely stakeholders. Uh, proponents then pre present their own human rights policy and the basic concept of the project. For step two, uh, please pay attention to 2.2, 2 2.3, and 2.4. Uh, these are about how to identify rights holder and their representative institutions. At step 2.2, .2, in identifying rights holder, proponents need to take into consideration not only written laws, but also customary rights. And at this, at this stage, uh, they should ensure all stakeholders can apply for recognition as rights holder. But as these claims arise, when such claims conflict with each other, proponents are required to suggest and facilitate the people involved to discuss it among themselves and resolve resolve the matter. At 2.3 and 2.4, in identifying representative institutions, proponents should respect uh, the method of community's own choice. On another front, uh, they also need to encourage the establishment of the institutions, which ensure that the uh, interest of all level of the community members are represented through confirming how marginalized and vulnerable groups are included into internal decision making process of the communities. Um, proponents confirm and verify if interest of all level of the community members are represented in their internal decision making or representative institution and their processes by gaining feedback from uh, marginalized and vulnerable groups, such as women and youth. Uh, this is not a one-off event and uh, hopefully uh, continue, if possible, throughout the implementation period of the project. At 2.7, Proponents first confirm that indigenous people and local community understand the human rights policy and the basic concept of the project, and then seek consent to move on the next phase from these community on which the project may have both positive and negative impacts. If proponent cannot, cannot obtain the consent, uh, they need to take some measures uh, such as excluding the area related to these community from the potential site of the project. Uh, step three, goal of this step is proponent confirm and agree with the community on the process itself during obtaining FPIC. They also implement capacity building activity which enable the community to effectively participate in consultation and project development, as well as establish the mechanism to deal with complaint or problem which may arise in such consultation and project development. At step 3.3, proponents preliminarily discuss, confirm, and agree with community on their engagement process to seek and obtain ethic from the community and the methods they use. Confirmation should also be made 
regarding not only negotiation process between proponents and the community, but also decision-making process within communities. It may seem troublesome to confirm that proponents should seek ethic from the community in accordance uh, to a mutually agreed process. In other words, to agree on how to agree. However, uh, not only the FSC, but also UN Red have a requirement to make the agreement ethic process, which cover almost the same points to check. Um, step four, participatory project planning. Uh, step four, participatory project planning, together with stakeholder involved in the project, pro proponent works on mapping to identify their rights, and based on the information gained through uh, this mapping, implement human rights and the social and em environmental impact assessment. Furthermore, in light of result from mapping and assessment, they design the detail of the project with participation of indigenous and the local community. Uh, at the end of this stage, proponent need, proponents need to obtain consent on entering final uh, negotiations. Uh, step five is a step for negotiation towards concluding agreement. Um, step seven and step eight uh, is a, uh, it's a um, uh, project implementation phase. Uh, in proceeding with the project, it's important to monitor whether the agreement terms are being met. Uh, following the monitoring plans developed in step four and five, proponents confirm with the participation of the community where the agreement terms are being met. Uh, they should publicize the monitoring result and if needed, negotiate with them on withdrawal of the consent. Uh, finally, we found uh, some uh, four point four challenges uh, in designing and implementing FPIC. Uh, point one, a gap between host country laws and proponent policy to follow international norms on FPIC. To deal with gap between host country laws and proponent policy on FPIC, we require proponents to conduct survey or legal system and the standards on host countries. Uh, if proponents are unable to comply with their own human rights policy due to the domestic circumstances uh, of host country, they have to seize the project or consider the measure to respect as much as possible international recognized human rights principle. Um, uh, another uh, challenge is participatory mapping. Uh, regarding participatory, participatory mapping, we have raised one question. To what extent project proponent can identify right holder to show legal and customary rights to land, territory, and resources, as well as uh, the actual land use situation? as these interventions could cause conflict unnecessarily among groups in the communities. To deal with question, we put to ensure any individual, group, or entity can apply for recognition as rights holder in step two and two. Uh, number three, uh, balance between respecting traditional ways of decision making and attention to vulnerable groups within the uh, community. Um, number four, the verif verification of ethic process. Uh, verification is very important to show ethic process is adequate enough as safeguard uh, to satisfy standards or indicator such as CCBS 
if proponents want to get uh, certification. Um, that's all um, now. Uh, I have, we have uh, our guideline on our website. Uh, we are very happy to have your comments on the guideline. Afterwards, um, we can share the guideline by handout. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuki. Um, then we next uh, speaker is Alison, and she's work, uh, working for uh, FSC's uh, forest certification for ecosystem services, and also she has ex experience on FPEC issues, and FSC implemented this new uh, guideline in 2012. Then I think FSC is really vigorously working on how to actually in practice. So yeah, please, Alison. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, the, the, the good, I have a good news and a bad news today. Um, what you, you in, in your introduction, you mentioned the fact that um, it's unlikely that there is an agreement within the next days on FPIC around RED. Well, the good news is that at FSC there is an agreement. The bad news is that we still have a lot to learn yet on how it's happening on the ground. And um, so let me... Um, first, let me introduce myself and then FSC, and then I, I'll, um, we'll, we'll see how, what is, what's happening regarding FPIC at FSC. I'm Alison Kettler. I'm the Global Project Manager for a dedicated project at FSC, which aims at testing um, ecosystem service certification on the ground. Um, I'm not a social expert. I studied business, and I will bring you a bit of my business and management background in that presentation, because we, we work for people, right? So we have a common... Um, a common concern. So I'm not a social expert, so I have to apologize in advance if there are some um, questions that I can't answer. Um, we have a social expert at FSC. She's called Vanessa Linforth, and I'll give you her email uh, so that you can link with her if you have any further questions. Um, first of all, who's, who is FSC? FSC stands for the Forest Stewardship Council. We are celebrating its 20 years anniversary today. It's 20 years of existence. FSC is developing standards um, in order to set best practices regarding responsible forest management. Um, and it's a pretty unique organization um, regarding forest. It has, um, because it looks into four, or sorry, three pillars, social, environmental, and economic um, aspects of forest management. And today we will focus on the social side. Um, just a quick, quick figures, FSC is certifying over 180 million hectares in the world as of today. That's a big, uh, a big step for us. But um, FSC has FP guidance since 2012, so since two years. Sorry, it's going a bit crazy here. Um, <laughs> FSE always had um, strong, strong safeguards regarding social aspects, uh, regarding indigenous people, communities in, the f in and outside of the forest management unit, what we call forest management unit, the forest. Um, so there is actually the new element within the FSE system since 2012 is the prior part. FSE had already free and informed consent uh, in its, uh, in its principles and criteria, now we have prior. And the other thing, the other thing we learned is um, that there's, there's actually very, we have very few examples of free prior informed consent implementation on the ground or the use of um, FSC um, in a FP context. So since 2012, FSC has guidelines. Um, it's, it's, it's a quite long document. It can be very theoretical. And uh, so the first thing is I would like to, if you want to have a look at that document, I give you the, the insider tip, which is to look at page 25 to 33, where you will have a summary and a checklist of uh, each steps um, regarding FSC and FPIC. And uh, regarding the steps, um, I was talking about my management background. It's really going crazy. <laughs> It wants me. <laughs> so, regarding management, the first thing we, we, we are told when we look into implementing changes on the ground, our teachers are telling us 
people are not usually not interested on the ground to know what will change. They are interested to know what will remain. Because change can produce so much stress on the ground. And um, so I, 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 like, I like your presentation, Yuki, because um, we saw what are the requirements regarding FPIC, and there's a lot of similarities within the FPIC guidance. Um, but there's one thing, and uh, what, I mean, one thing that I would actually would like to bring you from the ground. Um, going crazy again? I don't know. We'll, I wanted to show you a bit, a bit of uh, a nice picture from Nepal, but we'll see if it, if it comes. So, like two, year, two months ago, I was in Nepal, um, in a small community in the west, eastern region, where we are testing ecosystem services certification. And so we tested as well the FPIC guidance at FSE. And uh, you have all these requirements, these six steps, it's overwhelming. There are, and there are intermediary steps and the intermediary requirements. And after five days workshop with all stakeholders from that forest, um, the forestry, um, forestry agency, the indigenous uh, people um, representative, um, the forest owners, um, the forest owners association, we, we worked with many stakeholders. We looked at what actually, how compliant are they? How compliant are they with these six steps? And um, actually, after asking many questions, like how is your decision-making process, how are decisions taken, how do you involve everyone in the community, we realized that in Nepal, smallholders have such a sophisticated um, system in place already that the good news at the end of the day is, well, you're already fully compliant with FSC, FPIC requirements. Um, and so I, I think that that's actually a good news for, for, for these people um, because the conclusion of these days, they, were, they thought we would we would be working five days, and that would be actually the beginning of a long and painful process, um, thinking how could they do better, that we would leave, they would have an action plan. But at the end of these five days, they actually had the confidence that what they are doing is already very close to world's best practice. And um, so that's, that's what's going on at the moment. We are, FSC is testing the FP guidance in more than 10, 10 sites in the world in very different settings. We, uh, we are testing it in every, every continent um, in order to collect um, experience, to make the guidance more, um, more practical so that we can bring real cases. So there will be a second version of the guidance by the end of 2015, and you're more than welcome to um, bring in your comments into, into that document. Um, where can you find that document? Uh, within the FSC website, and also, don't hesitate to contact um, Vanessa Linforth, um, our colleague at FSC who's in charge of social policy at FSC. You have her email there, and don't hesitate to contact her. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alison, to uh, make your presentation very short. <laughs> and yeah, so FSC really has a lot very detail experience on how actually put, guidance is very thick and I'm also involved in the consultation process, but it's guidance is very thick, but how you actually make it impractical is very also another challenge, so I think it's look forward to see how FSC is trying to work on. Okay, and the next speaker is Grace from Tabateka Foundation and hope she could bring some uh, aspects from the indigenous community. Please. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for your presence here. Uh, I'm Grace Balawag. I am from the Philippines. I am from Tebdaba. This is the Indigenous Peoples International Center for Policy Research and Education. Uh, we are based in the Philippines, but we have worked globally with, uh, within 13 countries. And at the same time, we work very closely with other organizations like the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact and also of course the Forest Peoples Program and other uh, programs which have direct uh, work with indigenous peoples. Uh, yeah, uh, how is this? <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, I just focused my, my presentation on the key questions that were uh, yeah, that's, that were uh, suggested in this, uh, in our 
in this presentation. So I will be very much focusing on Red Plus, on why does Red Plus needs FPIC, and then why does a process that respects the right to FPIC consist of, and how should FPIC be applied in Red Plus projects, but of course this one will also still apply to all other forest-related uh, initiatives and other development initiatives within our communities. And what are the, uh, and then I will present a specific case in Vietnam, which was uh, facilitated by the UN Red with the government at the same time with the participation of indigenous peoples and where uh, very important lessons have been drawn up in this and it was the basis of improving more the guidelines that was finalized with UN Red. And then of course I'll provide you some key challenges in relation to our experiences on the ground, and then the opportunities also. As an introduction, uh, FPIC was hardly, uh, we are very glad that FPIC has, uh, and the other organizations have now developed their own guidelines and have given importance really to FPIC in relation to uh, various projects. And, uh, what was presented earlier by Yuki and also by Ali is a very detailed stepwise process and we very much appreciate that because what I will be presenting is much more on the broad uh, areas of FP and uh, of course the basic principles and some of the areas where confusion usually uh, or conflicts usually are uh, yeah, encountered in the process. So anyhow, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, f very much focused on this. Everybody knows about this, but I just would like to remind that uh, in Red Plus, we have the Cancun safeguards. And for us indigenous peoples, FPIC is one of the rights of indigenous peoples, which is uh, integrated in one of the uh, safeguards in relation to the respect for our knowledge and rights and uh, by taking into account international obligations such as the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Of course, we also know that uh, one of the safeguards is the full and effective participation of all relevant stakeholders, including in particular indigenous peoples and local communities which are forest uh, dependent. And of course, uh, we also give emphasis on the actions that are consistent with the conservation of natural forests and biological diversity. We know that these are, one, these are what we are pushing for in relation to the Cancun safeguards, and we will really be monitoring very strictly on, on this in, on the ground. Uh, yeah, of course, uh, another thing is, uh, yeah, I, the, one of the safeguards is respect for our knowledge and rights. And uh, for us, FPIC is a collective right of indigenous peoples as defined by international human rights uh, standards and also by the UN DRIP and uh, ILO 169. And uh, as a collective right, it has a set of principles that define the process or the mechanism. Uh, the ones presented already by Yuki have uh, already uh, defined some of the processes that we have to undergo here. Of course, basically it's an independent collective decision-making process with a full and effective participation of indigenous peoples. And uh, yeah, where appropriate, this should be done at all levels, at the local, subnational, and national levels. Uh, also, as mentioned already, I'm repeating some of the points that they have already said, but uh, we also reiterate that FPIC requires disclosure of all necessary information, which will serve as the basis for indigenous peoples to either accept or reject any proposal, project, policy, activity, or action that uh, really has impacts on their lives and, and our rights to the development of our lands, territories, and resources, and our well-being. Yeah. Uh, so, what does this consist of? Uh, this uh, is one of the cartoons made by the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact in relation to FPIC because they have developed a video and a comic, uh, yeah, comics on relation to the conduct of FPIC. Uh, 
Yeah, as I, I already mentioned this, but I would just like to emphasize the, def the how we define consultation and consent, because these are two different uh, aspects that we have to consider. Uh, of course, as, have, as uh, already mentioned by the other two speakers, consultation is uh, a process and a mechanism for information sharing and exchange of views, opinions on a certain proposal or action. So it's a continuing and iterative process, really, and does not, uh, it's not only one-time consultation and that's it. And then the consent will result from all of these uh, collective discussion-making processes, decisions arrived uh, through these processes with the uh, appropriate and necessary information that is provided, uh, internal deliberations among indigenous peoples ourselves, and our own independent decision-making process. Uh, the consent will really, it, the, the processes will really result in a collective decision of either giving or withholding our consent in relation to any project or action or decision. And uh, how should this be applied? Uh, of course, as we have said, uh, we, in the Red Plus process, uh, FPIC applies in all the phases and at all levels of decisions and actions on Red Plus. Uh, yeah, I, I'm repeating again this, that consultation effective participation of IPs at all levels and all phases. Uh, with uh, duly selected and authorized representatives identified by the, our, the indigenous peoples themselves. And uh, yeah, I mentioned also, also that it is a continuing process and uh, the basic information as well as uh, yeah, appropriate community-based trainings, capacity building should be provided in order to really understand what are all of these uh, proposals in, in relation to that, that may have impact on indigenous people's lands, territories, and resources. Now, uh, we have identified some critical issues for indigenous peoples in relation to the Red Plus process. For example, uh, there, these are some of the contentious issues that we really have to take uh, in consideration in relation to the FPIC process. For example, in identifying drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, uh, our traditional management of forests and our livelihoods in relation to rotational agriculture, or what they call in other areas as sifting agri-cultivation, had been uh, some countries have mentioned that this, are, this is one of the drivers, but basically we insist that this is part of our traditional management of the forests. We also, the land tenure rights is also an issue wherein we still insist on the respect and recognition of our customary ownership or control or management of our lands, territories, and resources, and the communal land rights and security of indigenous people should be recognized. Under forest governance, of course, we have also insisted that we have been uh, managing the forests and we have been stewards for generations of the forest. So our traditional sustainable use and management and other ecosystems should be uh, taken into consideration. And the most important is because we have customary laws, governance, and institutions in, in our governance systems. Uh, another point is on gender and intergenerational considerations. We have to take note of the role, contribution, and participation of women and youth, and of course with respect to the role of the elders in our communities. And then, as we have always said, Red Plus is not only about carbon, but non-carbon benefits and benefit sharing should be a, a the, the, the basis of why we have to participate in all these red, red plus processes. This should include our cultural and spiritual values, enhancing our economies and traditional livelihoods, and of course increase the land tenure security, enhancing biodiversity conservation, improve forest governance, policy reforms, among others. <coughs> And of course, we should do this with equity based on the needs and priorities defined by IPs in accordance to their management capacities. Yeah, uh, as I said, I will zero in on this Vietnam experience in FPIC piloting. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, this is already documented and have been circulated by the UN Red as one of the experiences that they have undergone. And this was uh, done in the province of Lamjung, Lamdung, where in the ethnic minorities are the main respondents and the uh, and, uh, participants in this uh, process. Yeah, there was a facilitation team that included ethnic minorities. That's what how they call the indigenous peoples of Vietnam. Uh, but this team had uh, uh, lacked substantive knowledge and understanding of Red Plus, FP, Indigenous Peoples' Rights, and their livelihood systems. Uh, there are effective forms of communications like posters, booklets, brochures, but these were not extensively used because of time allocated for uh, information dissemination, uh, which was limited. And then the information was not sufficient and lack substance on the rights and natural resource management of indigenous peoples. Yeah, and the focus was merely on the forest conservation and the economic benefits of Red Plus. Consent was taken merely by asking whether they want their forest to be conserved by raising their hands and by secret wilding in some of the communities. <laughs> and uh, of course, it's devoid of the potential risks and implications associated, associated with the land tenure, livelihood systems, and identity of indigenous peoples, among others. And this is explicitly explained already by the steps that uh, Yuki had, uh, that we have to take into consideration as explained by Yuki. And uh, the other lessons was that there was no time and opportunity for the community members to independently process and compare with information from alternative sources and then discuss and deliberate on their understanding, views, and concerns collectively prior to the decision making. So it was just a one-time process of uh, information sharing and then they wanted to have a decision immediately. And, and for indigenous peoples, this is not the case, <laughs> supposed to be the case. And then village reports were reported by the local facilitators, which lacked information on the issues and concerns which were really raised by the community, the ethnic minorities in the villages in the course of the meetings. And then lessons, so the, the, the good part is lessons from this experience was taken into account for the further development of the UN Red Guidelines on FP. And despite the weaknesses and limitations of this experience, it was a still positive learning process, especially with the support and cooperation of the government of Vietnam. The report was fully disclosed and uh, presented in UN Red meetings and then also in the regional meetings and uh, served as basis for, as I mentioned, to further develop the guidelines. But, uh, yeah, and if you go to the key challenges, yeah, it's always the case that there is lack of adequate information on the Red Plus or any other project that is being discussed on the community level. And of course, the forms and manner, in, in, in forms and manner that should be understood by the communities. Uh, yeah, we always require translation of all of the documents, so the government sometimes, and that's very expensive, or the corporations who come to our communities will say it's very expensive, but we, we, we always insist that, but this is necessary for us to be able to understand what you are proposing. And in relation to Red Plus, there is always a lack of understanding on this in the earlier days, but maybe I think after some process of awareness raising, capacity building, engagement with the government, uh, this has all been improved for now, but still these are the key challenges for countries who are uh, in the early processes of Red Plus and your own other projects. Uh, for, yeah, in the Philippines, for example, we have an Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act and we have a very good guidelines on in relation to the conduct of FP, but still uh, with corporations and others like mining, the extractive, other extractive industries, there is always misrepresentations, meaning they pick up the indigenous people's leaders that they want to talk to, and then sometimes they manipulate and uh, fast track the process because they just want to get already the FP in a quick time so that they can already implement their, their projects. And this is always the case, and I think this is not only in the Philippines, if, uh, this is also being done in some of the most of the countries. 
And, and then, as mentioned also, this is one thing that uh, we want to put in place, the independent monitoring and recourse mechanisms. You had also mentioned this. So we have to form credible individuals with deep understanding of IP's rights and experts to be doing this. And it should be accessible to our communities, and we, there should be mandate to address concerns of IPs and violation of the principle and processes of FP. Uh, now, the opportunities, as uh, we can see with the experience of the Global Environment Forum and also the Forest Stewardship Council, there are already new international and national standards and gu guidelines governing Red Cross and FPIC and other climate financing that are emerging. And FPIC guidelines developed by various Red Cross mechanisms and other multilateral international report agencies. And the uh, good part also of this is they are very open for comments. We have been receiving some of all these guidelines to provide comments and suggestions on how to improve these guidelines. And of course, some of the Red Plus countries are already piloting this ethic at subnational levels and drawing their lessons learned in the process with the participation of indigenous peoples. And uh, other countries are now showing willingness to undertake FPIC. Uh, there is also support for indigenous people's information systems and capacity building to engage more effectively. And there are now uh, indigenous peoples who are uh, more active and capable to engage constructively in Red Plus processes and also in other uh, mechanisms at the global, regional, national, and the local levels. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, for more information, we also ask you to visit our uh, website and also the website of Tabtaba and also the website of the Asia Indigenous Peoples. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace, for a very comprehensive uh, explanation by um, Indigenous community. Uh, I mean, why read require uh, very ethic uh, for them to secure the uh, indigenous community's rights. And okay, so now it comes to uh, Latin America case and Conrad uh, from FAP, I think, could explain about the cases uh, in Latin America um, regarding the ethic. And then, thank you. That's the uh, next one. Approximate for the Well, um, my name is Conrad Feather, I work for the Forest People's Programme, which is an international human rights organisation um, working in solidarity with forest peoples and uh, indigenous peoples around the world. Um, and I'm going to talk um, along the lines that, um, that, Grace, uh, that Grace referred to, um, thinking about some of the, the key issues that lie behind FPIC. Um, why it's important and uh, what can happen if it, if, if it isn't implemented. Um, what do you need? No. I'll give you the fourth. Yes, yes. 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 Um, I think the first, the first point to highlight um, is that FBIC in its uh, true sense is about levelling the, the, the power asymmetries that are, that are present out there in the, in the real world. Um, and as Grace highlighted, when it's a case of a large extractive company or a, a major development project in the national interest, and often the the rights of communities, even though there are excellent, excellent. Um, even though there are formal requirements for FPIC that are required, those those requirements are sort of undermined or manipulated or distorted um, in the process. Um, and that's why the C in FPIC, the consent, is absolutely crucial. Because in most cases, um, where it's the case of a large extractive company or a state project, um, 
it, it, it's that there's large asymmetries of power between the two actors, the community and the state, or the community and a multinational company, and it's the consent, the ability of the communities to withhold their consent, that's really the main um, bargaining chip that the communities can use to try and level that, that, that field. So if that consent isn't there, then we can't, um, we can't even talk about how um, FP could be implemented. Um, now, the other key issue that I want to highlight today is we can't also talk about EFPIC if we don't know what we're talking about. EFPIC is fundamentally about lands and territories and resources, and if those land rights and resources haven't been identified as great or highlighted, um, then, then we can't even begin to be talking about EFPIC. Um, and that applies to RED as well, obviously, as well as any other project. Because uh, RED is about carbon, the carbon is in the trees, and the trees are in the territories of the communities and indigenous peoples um, who occupy the land. So, um, just going back to the main point of why does RED uh, need EFPIC, um, it's a key safeguard. Um, let's not forget that RED is about uh, placing a value on forests that may not have otherwise been there, so it offers a potential incentive for land and resource grabbing. Um, uh, and just like any other um, external project proposed for indigenous people's lands, it could involve the uh, you know changing the way that people that the land is used or affecting the lands, which will uh, affect people's uh, collective rights. And remember that FPIC, as Grace said, is also a collective right. We're not talking about the FPIC of an individual, the leader of a village. We're talking about the, the collective right, and that's why FPIC also needs to. Um, faces the challenge of, of being captured by elites, internal elites within a village, which may often be manipulated by external interests, as um, a leader of a village may be um, manipulated into signing away uh, rights on behalf, of, on behalf of their village. Of course, there are all sorts of, as well as avoiding risks, uh, there are all sorts of positive reasons why any project will want to secure, uh, any external project will want to secure ethnic from 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 communities. Um, obviously requesting permission from the people you're about to work with is a minimum, uh, the minimum basis of any respectful relationship between two parties and without which uh, no benefits would be able to flow to local communities. So that's ethic in a more general sense. Um, and obviously this should be applied to, to both lands that are legally recognised in national legislation and lands that aren't recognised. Because even if, even if lands are recognised legally, then people's rights um, to that land can still be, um, can still be overwhelmed by uh, distorted processes of ethic, uh, or no processes of ethic. Um, the next one. Can pass the next Ah, you okay. um, So, but why is red different from other other projects. Well, fundamentally, we can't forget that RED um, is about proposing changes to how people use their lands and resources. Um, so it could, uh, uh, could involve a loss of access to the forest and a risk to food security, livelihoods and cultural identity which is associated with those livelihoods. It involves, um, will often involve projections into the future about how forests can be used uh, for the next 20, 30, 40 years. It may be linked to um, a commercial contract um, with conditions imposed on how forests can be used with long-term implications. Uh, we've seen in several cases where um, failure to comply with conditions means that, that, that communities will face uh, liabilities or even loss of rights uh, and access to forests. And of course there are even cases, there have been several cases in Peru um, involving contracts uh, written in English uh, with uh, highly unfavourable terms being signed by people who often are illiterate even in Spanish, um, signing contracts for up to 40 years using, using their land as um, um, so involving clauses that would, if people didn't meet the conditions, then land would um, be held um, in the form of a deposit by the uh, by the commercial operators, um, and extremely unfavourable terms, uh, just commercially. The other feature of RED 
which makes a difference, is that really it's still there's widespread uncertainty about what it's actually about. Um, how can we actually do a project when we don't even know uh, what it's about, what it might involve? It's not it's not about the production of coffee or, or timber, whether it's an established market or whether it's an established price, whether we will know what it's about. Something that's in, in, in development. So that raises the question of whether you can actually do Epic about Road if you don't really even know what it's about. Um, because of course Epic requires full disclosure. And of course, another issue is if, if it's being related to the carbon market, then um, that involves ethical considerations. Um, you know, offsetting is a bit highly controversial issue, and communities will, will need to have full information in front of them in, in, in order to make that. Um, extremely critical decision. So, as everybody has said, uh, there are some key elements that um, any ethnic process could, could consist of, which I won't go into too much, but just to highlight that, first of all, there's no, um, a, a, an ideal process would involve a, uh, um, a process set out by the village or community or people themselves about who is going to represent them, how the process is going to, to work, how it's going to be validated, and the timing, and, 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 and everything else. Um, and some peoples may have their own epic protocols um, already uh, in place. It involves an iterative process in which communities can withhold their consent uh, at various points, can decide to go on or suspend the negotiations, rather than a one-off yes-no decision. And fundamentally, it, involved, and it must require the prior identification of those of land rights, even if they're not held uh, in le legally in, in national terms by the community. Then um, it's fundamental that they're identified. So that's an example of um, of a sort of this kind of iterative process in which questions are asked, and at various points, um, communities can decide to withhold their consent and not continue discontinue the, the discussions. That's from a Rekoft um, publication that you can access. It's, it's very interesting. Now, just a couple of examples just to highlight um, how this is actually implemented. Um, one, one example is from Peru, where there was a, um, uh, a non-carbon market uh, reforestation project with a, with, a, with a village, indigenous village, which, or two villages in fact, which was then transformed into a full-scale avoided deforestation project. Um, there was, an, there was an, a concept note developed, there were advanced discussions with the financiers, and, um, and so on. Uh, they, they, the operators claimed that they'd been done, they did FPIC, but it was in, in process, um, but when uh, local organisations suggested that FPIC hadn't been implemented, they reacted extremely aggressively, um, and, but it resulted in them actually providing their documentation of what they consider to be ethnic. Um, and from this we can see the following. In the first village, um, eight out of 75 adult members, according to their information, had, had uh, been present at the meeting where the project was approved. And the second village, 35 out of 102 adult members. So this is their information um, that they were providing. Um, it was just a one-off decision about whether they wanted to opt in or out. Um, there was no discussion of carbon uh, because it was deemed to be too complex and could raise expectations that um, um, would, would, be, would be a risk to the project. There was no involvement of the, the people's uh, own representative organisations um, because they were deemed to be too uh, complicated as they would raise objections and criticisms and concerns. And when that organisation requested information to be able to provide back to their communities, um, they were not provided with it. Um, there's a report that FPP um, has just released on a, on a demonstration, UN Red demonstration project in Sulawesi um, in the last few days, uh, where which, which again evaluates claims that FPP has been secured. Um, on the good side, one of the first villages approached in this part of this demonstration project uh, rejected the project and. Uh, no negotiations were, were continued. Um, but in the subsequent villages, um, we see that it was a vi village where customary lands uh, were actually included within a, a national park, um, including farming lands. Um, but the land tenure identification of the project um, 
didn't recognise that. It just recognised the national park as state land, not customary land, and, and therefore the ethic of communities wasn't um, uh, wasn't required. Um, and and again, we see that um, ethic was reduced to a yes no choice. Um, but the evaluation revealed that uh, communities were asking questions such as what will be done next and uh, what will we get from this project which indicates and how long will we be able to access our gardens in the forest area after UN Red which indicates that several key questions still haven't been answered for them. So I'll leave it there so we can continue the discussion and thanks again for your time. Um, yeah, so that I think it really explains the difficulties of red. Like you promise something in for the effort, but you don't actually give in, giving up your rights over signing effort for the red. So that's I think quite unique for the red I think, compared to other schemes. Okay, so um, Maria, for please explain your case on the same. Good day, everyone. Um, I'm from Suriname, and I think most of you don't know where Suriname is, or do you? Latin America? I'm not going to talk about Latin America, all of those countries, because I I know I know I can talk about Suriname, but I cannot talk about all these countries in uh, Latin America with their own dimensions. Suriname is a Dutch colony, former Dutch colony, so we speak Dutch. Um, we have indigenous peoples in Suriname, so it's about 4% of the total population is, uh, are indigenous peoples. But we also have descendants of the slave race. Um, we call them Maroon. Actually, we call them tribal peoples in Suriname because we want to make the distinction between indigenous peoples and tribal peoples. Some of you will say that indigenous peoples are also tribals, so but that's true, but we want to make this decision because indigenous peoples in Suriname are the um, uh, authentic, the first peoples from Suriname, while the Maroon are the people who came in later. But at the same time, we recognize their rights uh, at the same way we recognize indigenous peoples' rights. And I think uh, most of you have heard about the Samaka judgment, and that was uh, um, in the court of the uh, OAS, how you call it, the Human Rights Court of the Latin America, of the Americas. And um, this case of the Samaka people who, has a tribal, uh, who are tribal peoples were just um, uh, decided um, as the same as uh, with the same rights of uh, indigenous peoples. I'm going to tell another kind of story here today. I, I'm going not. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the different steps and the processes uh, what you heard before in the other presentations. Uh, the presentation of me is more like what we are experiencing uh, right now. Um, it's more about the relationship we are building with an institution. This institution could be maybe your institution. And um, it's more like the, this institution decided to have a um, project. And with this, within this project, they want to strengthen our government to uh, have a better relationship, better engagement process with indigenous peoples in Suriname. It's about capacity building of the government. It's about capacity building of the government about the rights of indigenous peoples. Actually, well, I come, you will see it later as well, but this ID is coming from the resolution the PC resolution when the RPP was uh, approved um, in 2013 it was 
um, then we, like indigenous peoples, were in that meeting, in a PC meeting, and we were able to spoke, speak up, and we said, Suriname Suriname doesn't recognize indigenous peoples' rights legally. So we don't, in the, actually, indigenous peoples in Suriname doesn't exist. So for that reason, all these things like FPIC are very, very important for us. Of course, we are uh, uh, fighting for our rights, have our rights legally recognized. Um, but at the same time, we are working with things like FPIC, like as if we have land. I think Conrad was talking about that uh, part as well. Um, uh, we are, um, during the FCPF meeting, uh, the PC meeting last year, uh, we said uh, one of the things we should have in our RPP to prepare ourselves for maybe a red project um, is that the capacity of our government need to be uh, uh, strengthened. They need to know more about indigenous people's rights because they just don't know. If you're talking about land rights and things like that, they are still saying you want to build a state within a state. So um, these are not the ideas what indigenous people in Suriname have about land rights. So that's the reason why, uh, one of the reasons we want to um, strengthen their capacity. And the idea was that within the money of the finance of the FCPF is that a part of that finance will go to the indigenous peoples so that we can have the ownership about that finance and see how we ourselves can do this uh, capacity building uh, process with the government. And that's still in the project document, it is approved now, so um, we are looking forward that we are getting this finance sooner or later. But at the same time, this institution in Suriname decided to do the same thing. When they heard about this part of the RPP, they decided, okay, but we can do that as well. So they um, uh, drafted this project. The project was approved and they started the project um, without speaking, consulting indigenous peoples and tribal peoples in Suriname. But the project was approved by uh, international government and uh, actually the first time I heard about this project was last year in Warsaw. At the COP in Warsaw I heard this institution during a side event telling about the project and saying yes and Suriname is one of the countries who is part in the, uh, of this program and we will work in close collaboration with indigenous and tribal peoples from Suriname but we were not even informed by that time yet. So what if the institution approach, which approach you as indigenous people's organization, since I'm working for an indigenous people's organization, and ask you to consulta do consultations uh, um, with indigenous peoples in Suriname. If this institution explains that indigenous peoples should co contribute to con the content of a project, but this project is already drafted and approved. That the goal of this project is to strengthen the capacity of the government to better the engagement process with indigenous peoples and make FPIC an instrument used by the government, because that's one of the important um, goals of this project of the, this institution. What if this institution is an environmental organization? Maybe, if, I don't know if you see the link, but the strengthening, doing a project, strengthening the government, but this uh, institution is an environmental organization. And this institution will make you partly responsible for the outcomes of that project. And what if? The indigenous peoples has no good experiences with this institution, in particularly some individuals. And that the indigenous peoples are also worried about the political position of this institution. 
especially the way their policy about the relation between environment and indigenous people's territories. And if the indigenous people stress that capacity building of government by indigenous people's organizations should be part of the implementation of the RPP. That's what I uh, tried to explain just uh, before that it is now becoming part of the, has become part of the project document to um, prepare ourselves for the, for, I don't know, maybe a um, Red Plus project. The process of engagement. This is what I call the process of engagement and um, most, mostly I will talk about that. I'm not going into detail about, of the, we are not, we are very um, in the beginning of the process, so I cannot speak about how the process will go further, but for us this is at this moment a very important uh, part of the process and I think maybe this can be the most important part of the process because if you are indigenous peoples and you have um, to work with other partners, but you cannot trust these partners, but you have you need to work in collaboration with others. And if your uh, engagement part is not a good part, then uh, you might have a problem with that. So um, these were our questions of course, um, to this institution, why, why should we start to work in collaboration with you? This is what I mentioned, it was uh, said in the resolution uh, in 2013, when um, Suriname's case was approved, and this says that um, we will, in, co in collaboration with indigenous and tribal peoples, people's representatives in the work plan, start a process to identify, identify the need for it and to provide capacity building in government institutions with respect to indigenous and tribal peoples' issues. We started our own uh, internal presentation, uh, consultations only for the question if we want to work in collaboration with this institution. Why should we do that? And um, why should we invest in, in this whole process? <coughs> the chiefs, because I'm working for the chiefs, agreed to try to start and to build a relationship with this institution because they think it is very important to work in collaboration with other partners. So, um, they said we can work together, but we have to do all, everything, every step based on FP. <coughs> I very quickly will uh, only mention this because of lack of time. <coughs> but because this institution only knew two kinds of type of contracts, they offered us a contract like a consultant and within this contract, it was said that we would, uh, they will get all the own all the products out of this um, um, consultancy job. And the consultancy job was actually to uh, one of the parts was to um, talk about the consultation. How should the consultation process be? And um, so they wanted to have all the products and all, own all the products, but how can you hand over uh, a communication strategy, com uh, ideas about communication you have with your tribal peoples, with your indigenous peoples? You cannot hand that over. You can, of course, advise them and tell them how to do, but they, it was written in their uh, contract that you, everything you will put on paper will be owned by them. I will, uh, <laughs> and uh, this was not possible for us to uh, sign such a contract. So we had a whole long discussion, and I, that's why I'm calling it the second phase of the process. We had a whole long discussion talking about these issues. We spoke with uh, the uh, lawyers who are based in the uh, he in headquarters. We had to come. We ourselves had to come with solutions, with wordings they could use within the contract, where we can feel us, ourselves satisfied, but they didn't, the lawyers didn't have the idea of this international institution, 
how to formulate some uh, a language where indigenous peoples can find themselves as collective people, uh, can find themselves uh, comfortable to um, sign uh, agreements like this. Um, so we ended up because we came to a solution, we, we did uh, sign the contract, we were still called cons consultants, but uh, the part of the ownership um, we came to a solution and I just hear, uh, heard uh, last day, uh, one of these days, that um, this institution now have a third kind of contract because of the process, because of talking with the other, because it was really a long process and we invested a lot of our time to speak with uh, the institution to tell them how we feel about things and, how, and now they started to um, understand us so this institution now have a third kind of um, uh, co type of contract. So it will be more easy for indigenous peoples now. That's what they say. I haven't seen the contract, but let's trust them because this whole process is also a uh, an process of um, trust. And other than that, I can not tell you about um, um, how it will go further. We are still in the process working with this um, um, uh, institution. Uh, we are now facing problems because they are saying um, you ha don't have enough um, time anymore. Um, we have to go to the communities, we have to have the consultations there. But time is lacking now, so they are, they are, there's a bit of uh, time constraint. Uh, there is no budget to go to all these communities, they say, so we have to figure out how we uh, will consult all these people because we cannot go to all these communities. And uh, yeah, there are still some challenges, but still we are trying and it is also for us a learning process, but we see that is most ways. Also the institutions, and I think that's more the message, also the institutions who are saying we are working with both FPIC and we are, FPIC is within our policy. That will mean that you will change your our own policy to make FPIC work. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much to share your struggle on this course for the process of communication. Okay, so the last speaker is Martin from, uh, he's uh, as a lawyer, he could also, I'll uh, experience his work on the uh, case of the Okay, thank you. So, this is the highest representative. Uh, sure. Please keep it. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um, <coughs> thanks for the very good preceding presentations which picked up some of the issues I was going to touch on. Um, <coughs> just by way of background, I'm both a lawyer who works for a private firm, but also on the board of an NGO, WWF in Australia. We're doing a lot of read work. So, I see a lot of things from different perspectives. Um, the first thing I want to say is, I think the comments that were made earlier, that red is very difficult. What we are basically presenting here is we're presenting an entire new suite of legal rules and concepts that are being applied to an existing resources base. So you're basically going to a country and saying a forest or areas of forest that are already subject to either um, they're either owned by indigenous groups or the national park or they are subject to forestry concessions or mining concessions or a range of different uses is then being put over the top with an entirely different set of um, rules which were also introducing brand new concepts carbon rights non-carbon benefits all these these things which we talk about but which actually are not defined in law so nowhere in the Unitable Sea Agreements does it actually define what a carbon right is or what a non-carbon benefit is. There's a lot of talk about it, but it's actually not in the agreement. The second thing is um, that it is also an issue that will, will bring up conflict. And it's conflict because of the fact that you have competing interests at, um, from the outset. And thirdly, we are worlds apart here in talking about what an Indigenous group um, or Indigenous community may want in terms of their own forests and what a financier sitting in, 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 whether it's the Norwegian Ministry of Finance or sitting in the World Bank under the FCPF or whether it's sitting in a private bank in Europe, they are worlds apart in terms of what they're thinking. 
but there was one very significant common goal. People who finance red want to make sure that if it works, because if you're a real financier and you're really concerned about transferring money, whether it's public donor money or private money, FPIC is absolutely critical. So the examples that you gave are um, about bad FPIC performances. I would say that is not indicative of most people in the carbon market or, or, or the financiers that want to pay for environmental services. That, that they are very bad examples, and we've seen throughout history in the carbon markets, particularly in places like PNG, some very bad examples of failure to consult. But but at a general level, um, part of the the reality of safeguards is that most of the people now who want to fund and finance results based in the red space think that FPIC is very important. Um, so ultimately, who will FPIC be, be driven by? It will either be driven by um, a suite of international rules as they develop, it will be driven by domestic governments who say we require certain things to happen, it will be, it will be driven by by indigenous peoples who are saying, you know, we have an expectation that we understand what, what is happening. And it will also be driven by donors and financiers who are saying that we have a certain level of expectation to be met before that happens. Um, the other interesting thing is that quite often we have seen examples of where, I um, think there was a comment made that often indigenous groups don't really know what their rights are. We're increasingly seeing, um, we've seen that the law has been ignored and that in many countries, indigenous groups actually have very strong constitutional rights which are overlooked and governments make decisions on FPIC or make decisions on allocation of resources ignoring the constitutional right to indigenous groups to resources. And we've seen in Indonesia, adapt community rights have been awarded by the High Court there. We've seen in Brazil decisions have been made and in other countries as well. So I think sometimes we forget that there are actually some quite good strong constitutional grounds for for um, for uh, local communities and just groups to claim a very strong standing that you, that, that you must deal with us as well. Um, and then he's also on top, on, on top of customary licenses. So the, the one sort of thing I wanted to just give an example of today is that ultimately a lot of what we talk about here is a partnership. It's a partnership, when we talk about red, Red will not succeed unless there is money on the table. Um, it's all very well to talk about we want people with carbon benefits and non-carbon benefits, but unless someone is prepared to actually pay for those, and actually, and um, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the market context, it can simply be in a results-based uh, manner, um, it will not ultimately succeed. And the view of donor countries is that we're happy to kickstart this, but ultimately we expect the private sector to come in and also help fund um, a lot of red. So if we are going to have private sector finance, we need to accept that that's going to happen and we need to then make sure that FPIC is, is carried out properly. So ultimately a lot of this means a partnership between finance, a partnership between indigenous groups and a partnership between people who are implementing projects. Now, <clears throat> one of the interesting models, and a lot of the talk today has been about the problems. So one of the ways is what are some of the solutions that we can do to get past that? And one of the models that's been adopted, you know, it is in a developing country context. Uh, sorry, a developed country context is in Australia. Um, for many of you who don't know, Australia has a long history of, of indigenous um, presence there. Over 40 million years we've had the, the Aboriginals in Australia. And what happened was the Europeans came to Australia and the government declared all the land to be crown land owned by, by the Commonwealth of Australia. Um, and for many years the indigenous rights were ignored. And what, is, what ultimately happened was in, there was a, a, a High Court constitutional case um, by a gentleman called Eddie Marbo, which led to an act called the Land Rights Act, and now um, Indigenous groups have land rights in Australia where they're able to claim ownership rights over land. At the same time, many of that Commonwealth land, which is subject to native title claim, is also subject to mining leases or forest leases or other concessions. So what the government has introduced are these agreements called Indigenous Land Use Agreements, where the parties come together and negotiate an outcome. But that process generally takes two years, but it's a matter of everybody sitting down around the table, coming to an agreement about uh, who has what rights and how to allocate it. And so issues of land tenure are not, uh, are not really relevant in the sense that we've identified players who have an interest, but we try to resolve through these agreements. And again, they take a long time, but ultimately the, the, they result in an agreement as to 
who can use the land, in what context, try to have mutual recognition of different rights and allocate the benefits between different parties. So we also need to look, you know, if, FPIC's critical and we need to look at solutions in which we can get good FPIC outcomes and at the same time set out as by finance if we want to have, have real evolve. So that's just, just, just one example I wanted to give, but it is, a, it is quite a useful example which can be applied in many contexts. Thanks. Martin, thank you very much for summarizing, and that's a very great uh, summary of our here. Today. So, finally, we just open for all for the questions. We start five minutes late, so we have, I think, five minutes or ten minutes for the questions. So, we can. Any, any questions or comments on. Pro? Okay. So, we just get a couple of questions, then. Uh, thank you, I'm Steady from Puma, Indonesia. Um, I just want to add one, one more um, comment on what's already reflected by the presentation from Conrad. Again, we have to begin central Sulawesi done by uh, UN Red. Actually, it's not, it's, it's even, it's not even uh, uh, Done. It's it's a uh, it's vice versa. FPIC in the model of the, uh, claiming FPIC as an instrument, but as a way to support the rights of this state to the conservation area. So those that uh, gave the consent to the uh, FPIC process is not communities, but the Minister of Forestry. So that's the key lesson from Central Service if you don't start really with the clarification of tenure and, uh, and rights to land, then it will be ended up in giving a blank check to the government to check their own rights that we own this land. And this is exactly happen. The second one is regarding the information. What, whatever it, the tickets look like to make people understand about the information, but if it's not clearly uh, guide the people on how to understand the language is, then it will be trapped again into the, like giving uh, junior high school lessons, but uh, you know, have no direction on what exactly the objective of the information is. And uh, third, uh, sorry, I, I want to ask, Add one more thing on the legal questions to Martin, uh, because we also work on the same uh, process in Indonesia regarding the constitutional court. The problem for, for the legal question is because all of this territory has been established in the past, and there's no uh, uh, retroactive principles in law to take back again the land that has been claimed by the government or by the state. And it's difficult now, for example, for Indonesian a constitutional court is to implement because all of this land has been in service in 1960s, 1970s. And it's, it's, it's now, for example, for indigenous people try to claim back the land, but how they challenge before the court? The court is, you know, 2012. But the, the decision on land is already, you know, even before the, uh, even before the uh, forestry law was established in 1960s. So that's the question actually for us as a lawyer. I am also a lawyer, like Martin, and it's difficult to answer those questions when people really want to ask whether their land can be taken back or you know, just leave it like as it is and government still claim it is a state forest or state land. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So I take a couple of questions, please. Then. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Gertrude Kenyanji. I'm from Uganda. And Uganda is participating in both uh, Red Plus and UN Red. We are a community based organization, I'm a representative of a community based organization that is expected to be a practitioner in implementation of Red. But we are also very worried about Red for historical reasons. In the past, power, powers came and colonized Africa and took away most of our resources. 
when we were looking. And now, still red is a, a top-down approach. It's not conceived at the grassroots level. It's not our idea. It has come. We know that there's free prayer and informed consent, but it's not our idea. We have not conceived it. And they are saying you are going to benefit share, that you are going to. Uh, how can we guarantee that it will happen? When the things we could see were taken from right under our nose, and now this carbon dioxide, which you cannot see, will not be taken the same way. Yeah, so that's one of our reasons why we are worried about trade. It may not apply here because it's in Africa, there, yeah, it's in Africa, but red is red wherever it is. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So maybe Andres can answer Okay, so the batteries? Yeah. Yes. So you just tie together. Yeah. Good. Thank you. My name is Patrice Levang. I'm working for C4. Um, more globally about uh, the FPIC process, there is a basic assumption which comes up uh, quite often is community, common decision making, and so on and so on. And uh, the, this basic assumption is that communities speak in one, with, with one voice. And uh, when we talk about uh, power asymmetry, I agree that it's in making a lot of progress in uh, solving asymmetry between the, the state and uh, big companies with communities. But these communities are made of it's a bunch of individuals with very different interests. And who is speaking in the name of the communities? It's generally very specific people, aristocratic groups, uh, castes, and so on. And uh, I have an example, a recent example in, in Liberia, where a big company tried to, um, not to access to land, in other words, uh, to for land grabbing. And they were accused by local NGOs of not taking uh, the, the proper ways to discuss with people. So what they did is uh, they started all over again, they hired an NGO, paid the NGO quite well, they organized an epic, and they got the approval exactly what they wanted before. So I'm just, this is one example, but it's what comes up very often. If you really want to get people's voice, just have an NGO talk in the name of the people and you get what you want. So one more, and then we will back to the panel speakers. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will be very brief because of time limited. I don't have a specific uh, question, but just very two short comments. The first one, yes, FPIC, it, 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 it's a fundamental uh, principle, rights, and, and, and mechanism for indigenous peoples and their communities. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it has a very strong relation to a uh, land rights issue. And the other issue is how to incorporate uh, uh, FP principles to the national and domestic uh, legal framework. And the, the second comment is uh, um, uh, there are a lot of inter institutions, international ones, and even financial institutions, NGOs, and indigenous peoples are very actively involved into FP development and promotion. But we should keep in mind that the next step of development of PIC is. Uh, negotiation with business, business society, and we should think and create specific venue to invite business to be a part of dialogue, because it's, it's, it's a two-two ways roads, so, and we should uh, uh, approach as, um, uh, as soon as possible in the future. Thank you. Okay. So, maybe Colin or just Nadia, just one or two quick responses. One. In everybody's presentation, and as you've said, land tenure and land rights come up. I just want to make one point, is that in many countries we will never resolve land tenure. It is a generational issue that is often dealt with in very difficult ways and, and, and there's no easy way to fix it. So we actually have to find ways in some countries that go above land tenure by saying, we don't know what the tenure is, but everybody who's involved will agree this is how we're going to manage areas. So we do need to think beyond <coughs> I mean, I would love in many ways tenure to be resolved, but in many countries it would just not happen for, for generations. So we need, we need to think about alternative models. Um, secondly, um, your point's very right about business. And um, the, the point that you were making, so the Australian example, if you just picture this, 200 years of, of 
white settlement in Australia, where land has been granted to people under a land system, 200 years later, is completely over, not overruled, but is completely subjected to a new regime where indigenous rights are granted and over certain areas owned by the government. Much of that land is given back, or if you're a farmer or a pastoralist or a miner, you have to now deal, deal with that land in, in, in a way that, that works with indigenous groups, and therefore all these parties get together and they have to come to an agreement. And in those situations, you can have 15 different indigenous groups, all who are represented by different people who conflict and have different views, and you have to make provision for future groups which you didn't account for at the time. And it's a very interesting process and it takes a long time, but at the end of the day, it incorporates dealing with tenure, dealing with benefit sharing, dealing with, um, with unclear ownership and making sure that customary rights are acknowledged. So, Conrad, or any comments back? Well, just I think most of the interventions were mainly comments, but yes, um, Patrice, was it Patrice? Yeah, I mean, yes, of course, um, elite capture is a, is a real risk, as everybody's highlighted, and that's why it's, it's necessary for people to come together themselves and decide how are they going to make collective decisions, because EPIC was originally conceived from a medical model in terms of getting security individual consent of patients for medical interventions and that application to collective processes um, is not necessarily something that's customarily held by, commu by communities or peoples, but in many cases it is. Um, or in other cases it needs to be developed and that's why you need this time, as Martin has indicated, you need time for those people to come together and develop their own processes and work through all of that messiness and that time can't be constrained by some um, you know, requirement that 90 day requirement that a decision has to be delivered. And I fully agree with our friend from um, Uganda that the fundamental point, the problem, um, and we're not a red implementer, so it's not our problem, but um, I can see the faces of red implementers sort of um, turn grey when they see this huge list of requirements. But that's because this is a top down idea, it's not coming from communities, and um, it presents all sorts of risks. In, and, and challenges. Um, whereas if it's a, if there's a bottom-up idea coming from communities, it's a completely different um, issue. Just one final comment. I'm not sure I agree with Martin that um, we have to go beyond land tenure. Um, I'm not aware of many initiatives in the world at the moment where I can see that governments are really trying to address or dedicating energy to um, addressing land tenure. I think in the case of Australia, it's really different from most other places. Um, there are pledges and commitments um, where governments are doing lip service to land tenure. In, in, in Peru, for example, where they say yes, we're going to replace indigenous lands. But if you compare the amount of energy or funds they dedicate to this issue to um, you know, developing guidelines for FPIC or um, you know, building the Lima Metro, for example, um, you'll see it, it, it's, it's clearly not a priority. Certainly in Peru, there are very clear um, ways to resolve land tenure. People have been working on their own, making maps, uh, doing agreements, boundary agreements with neighbours. The maps are all there, the claims are all there. Um, this has been there for decades, but the Bruno government has done nothing about it. Um, so I, I think it's a case of a political commitment, because when they want to resolve land tenure in favour of forestry concessions, mining concessions, rural concessions, they can do that very quickly. When it comes to communities, it just doesn't happen. It's, my point is that in many countries, not everywhere, but particularly Africa, um, there are no land tenure systems, or you find pieces of land that may have 17 or 18 different claims. Um, and, and everyone thinks that if we solve land tenure, we will solve the red problem. Uh, uh, in, in an ideal world, you're right, clearly, if the world was there, you could possibly do it. But I can tell you there's, um, the, 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 there's a, one of the requirements in the FCPF contracts is that land, uh, carbon must be, emission reductions must be transferred free of any encumbrance and, and, and free of any claim to many other party. Well, if you're talking about transferring car, um, carbon for payments from land that has 18 different claimants on it, it's not a clear transfer. So I think that we sometimes underestimate, you know, particularly in the Indonesian context, where the mapping has been now taken place, but I can give you areas of land that are subject to 15 different claimants. And which have been granted, and they're all valid legal claims. 
that will totally conflict some of the mining, some of the forestry, some of the traditional. So uh, I just think it's, it's dangerous to think that if we can't solve land tenure, we can't solve red. I mean, land tenure is important, it's fundamental rights, but sometimes if we can't resolve it, we need to just be able to move on and find another solution. That's really important. Yeah, thanks. Grace? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I will be very brief. I will just say that uh, in any development uh, proposals uh, without the, the required ethic and uh, also decisions from the Crown uh, to approve this or reject this, uh, initiatives that will be successful really if we do not uh, respect this. Uh, process and also to consult the, the, the real uh, representatives of the communities because uh, basically as I said one of the challenges is really misrepresentation and also manipulation of the process. Uh, I also mentioned in one of uh, the meetings with some of the governments in who are the Red Plus countries are is that uh, we have all these guidelines, uh, very good guidelines but uh, uh, the, the implementation of this is country specific or area specific because then depending on who will be implementing these guidelines because guidelines can be manipulated really depending on the interests of those who are uh, getting our consent or uh, uh, just for the sake of uh, enforcing their uh, plans but definitely all of this did not be successful in the end because it did not go through a process of, of uh, uh, pro participation and decision making uh, with, in, with people who are really on the ground and who will be impacted on these projects and uh, other initiatives. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So um, we are kind of taking rounds and maybe some last. Um, yeah. Thank you. I'm Richard Kapere from Uganda. I'm just asking about the scope of FPIC. How wide should, should I consult? If I'm going to implement a red flag project within the boundaries of the national park, for example, the nascent of capital stocks, knowing that these national parks are uh, managed on behalf of the people of the country, should I consult the whole country? Should I consult the labor communities? Oh, I should not consult anyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any last comments? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your presentations, and I do not take so long to keep you here because it's already just twelve fifteen. I'm from South Korea, Pyongyang. Great to have your presentations here. I have one question, and uh, you, you mentioned the non-carbon benefit can be paid, and it's not fully discussed in the CAP or any decisions so far. And please, could you please explain how it can be happened without any like standards or procedure uh, like suggestions? Thank you. Supposedly uh, going to involve everyone within the the defined territory that is being covered. Uh, sometimes in in most cases, before we do this, uh, they also map out which areas are are affected with the implementation of a certain project. So if it is. Uh, crossing boundaries, etc. They have to settle conflicts among the people who will be there, who are there, and who will be affected with all of these uh, uh, projects. So, so it either you, it's area specific really, depending on who are the defined rights holders of the land, and who are going to be impacted with these, either directly or indirectly. 
So all of these are going to be considered in the process. That's why on the stepwise presentation of UT, there is a need for identification of the landowners, land rights holders, or whatever you define them, the, the managers of the land or whatever, so that it would uh, define the scope and uh, yeah, and the people that you are supposed to be getting their uh, consent. What's the next question? The question on non benefits. Um, so I think the fundamental point about forests is that obviously it's not, as everyone knows, just about carbon. It's about all the benefits that are there. The agreements talk about emission reductions and all of the value that's used in terms of any commercial transactions to date, whether it's the VCS, the FCPF, even to some extent the Norwegian allies talk about emission reductions. Um, so. Uh, so I think and it's, 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 it's the unit which, is, which provides the monetary currency for doing these transactions. We need to be able to now move to talk about non-carbon benefits. So people will, under the gold standard or CCSB, they will put more value on projects that have added benefits, and that's a pricing issue. But um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do here in this process is to create a value for the non-carbon benefits and to recognise that they have a value as well as the carbon, and the challenge today is that the value of forest is more in its timber, or in, or in the minerals under the ground, or in chopping it down for palm oil than it is in giving those benefits. So, one of the steps to having results-based finance is to say one of the results is to save those non-benefits, and that will get us on the journey towards defining those benefits and creating them. There are very few schemes around the world, or, or very few programs that define the benefits. The, the, there are certain schemes, that particularly in, in the states and elsewhere, that define water rights or define biodiversity rights, biodiversity credits. But they're fairly few and far between. But, but hopefully, at, through a results-based financing mechanism, by saying the results we want are not just carbon savings, but biodiversity savings, indigenous community benefits, etc., we can start to, to define those a little bit better. Um, okay. So FSC is developing ecosystems uh, an ecosystem services certification scheme, and uh, that's actually worth first. There is no standard in the world that covers so many ecosystem services um, from the forest. We are actually developing a system which, which will allow governments, investors, and companies to confidently invest into ecosystem services um, from managed forests. And that's a process in the development. So that's something we would uh, definitely um, aim at covering over time. Not only the carbon benefits, but all, all other types of benefits from the forest. They are already safeguarded by FSC. The thing is that certificate holders are not able to make claims yet about it. We had certificate holders calling FSC, I'm sorry about the sound, um, calling FSC saying, well, I have a river running in my forest. I'm not using my forest for timber. I won't use the FSC logo on wood, but actually I, I'm FSE certified because FSE is giving me um, a, a, a benchmark on how to manage my forest. And I would like to be able to, meet, to make claims about that water. What can I do? I would like to be able to make claims about the carbon. I'm already uh, VCS certified, but I can't really use my FSE certification. So we are adapting the system so that certificate holders can, be, can get the credit, can be rewarded for <coughs> the stewardship they are doing on ecosystem services. That would mean additional work, but that would mean probably, hopefully, additional benefits. Yeah, okay. Maria, so maybe last some is okay. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you very much for uh, staying until the last time. And since the issue is quite everyone is really this is key on safe cars and so on. And I think since most of the this red money involves the public money. So I think this is how we can able to try some way to ensure how the safety of safeguards are ensured in the spread system. And we actually still, our guideline is still a work in progress. So we have actually expressed it if you are interested and we try to work on these issues. And so hopefully we could um, continuously go maybe next COP GNR or something like that and hopefully continue on this work. And so thank you very much for the panelists. Uh, and also for the participants and for the event staff and translation. Thank you very much. To, uh, and it's really great that we could have
have this kind of discussion today. And also Yuki, of course. <laughs>